Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming in this snowy day. Um, bon matin à tous. Je m'appelle Dominique Charon et je suis la vice-présidente. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Ms. Charon and I'm the director of the program at the International Development Research Centre. Dominique Charon, I'm the vice president of programs and partnerships here at the International Development Research Centre, or IDRC. Uh, and happy International Women's Day to all of you. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are meeting here on the unceded territory, uh, traditional territory of the Algonquin people, and acknowledge in particular on this day um, Indigenous women and their struggles over centuries to realize their rights and aspirations. Je vous remercie de vous joindre à nous pour célébrer la I'd like to thank you for joining us here to celebrate International Women's Day. The conference will take place in both French and English and there is a simultaneous interpretation service and headsets are available. Where, where are the headsets? Uh, they're at the back of the room. Today's event is also being recorded on video so that a broader public can have access to our meetings. Simultaneous translation is available. The headsets are at the back here. Um, and the event is being video recorded to post later on our website so we can reach more people than can be with us today. Nous sommes très heureux d'accueillir ce panel ce matin. We're very glad to host this panel today that will be exploring the links between women as economic actors and as agents who contribute to climate resilience in uh, southern countries, the global south. The International Women's Day is an opportunity to celebrate the social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women throughout the world. It is also a forum for a discussion that absolutely must be had about the major hurdles that women continue to face. It serves as a global call for collective action and shared responsibility for achieving gender equality and creating an inclusive, safe and sustainable environment for all women and girls. Together with our other Canadian government partners and international partners and co-funders, IDRC contributes to Canada's international efforts to address barriers to gender equality and women's rights. Le Centre Soutien des Recherches qui s'attaque... The Centre supports research that deals with the deep-rooted structural causes for gender inequality in the, the Global South. And we will continue to ensure that women uh, young girls, uh, children, enjoy the same opportunities as men and boys and so that they can contribute on an equal footing to ensure that their world becomes more progressive and that the environment uh, is safe and cleaner. Research has shown that gender and social differences are not only sources of vulnerability, they're sources of resilience. They are, it's also clear, from our work and that of many others, that gender inequality affects different groups in different ways. The more marginalized the group, the more profound may be the impact of gender inequality for women and people who identify as LGBTQ, for example. IDRC is focused on gender equality as part of this wider agenda of inclusion to help find solutions that will help those who are currently marginalized on the road to the Sustainable Development Goals, such that they are no longer left behind and are enabled and empowered to contribute to building resilience to climate change and a more sustainable future for themselves and their children. Le CRDI a soutenu une série de projets IDRC has supported a number of projects uh, to mobilize the private sector in order to fund adaptation and climate change resilience and to build bridges between research, policy and business when it comes to funding adaptation and also to gather momentum when it comes to adaptation and climate change resilience the link between adaptive capacity and the household at the household level 
and women entrepreneurs' capacity to adapt to climate change, climate-related stresses within their businesses. In the Kenyan case, the study found that social and cultural norms that shape gender roles and resource use and access to services and resources not only confined female-led small and medium enterprise to sectors that experience a bigger exposure to that climate impact, such as agriculture, but it also led to significant barriers to women being able to build their resilience within their businesses, including these barriers included reduced access to land, uh, having trouble getting the same access to capital or markets or technology that their male um, uh, family members and, and uh, neighbors had. This, uh, due to these barriers, then female entrepreneurs may cope with climate-related stress in ways that ultimately they uh, undermine their long-term resilience. They're taking short-term decisions to deal in the short term, such as selling off business assets or scaling back their business activities due to drought or a severe weather event. Social networks, such as women's groups and table banking initiatives, appear to be crucial then in helping them to adapt on the longer term. Additionally, a strong dependency exists between resilience in the household and the women's business resilience, which suggests that resilience at the household level could support more of that uh, resilience and preparedness in the, in the business environment for women uh, entrepreneurs. Supporting this adaptive capacity of women then in business is a good, we think, uh, policy priority. Les femmes sont aussi des agents de changement. Women are change agents. And in collaboration with Environment and Climate Change Canada, the Government of France and the Institute of the Francophonie for Sustainable Development and a network of African science consultants, there have been a number of cohorts of over 50 women that are representing African Francophone countries in the United Nations political processes to do with climate change. This training supports these women so that they can move forward with strong, robust proposals that are evidence-based in the negotiation processes to make African women a strong voice in this important decision-making process and also so that African countries can take a stand in these debates. ...and the voice of women and girls by investing in them and leveraging their knowledge uh, and position in households and society to bring about change that benefits everyone. Today's panel brings together experts who are working across women's economic empowerment and climate change, and they will speak to a range of issues, including the most promising efforts for removing or minimizing barriers to women's economic empowerment, the risks and opportunities associated with climate change and how they are addressed, and how the private sector can enable women's economic empowerment and resilience to climate change. It's my pleasure to introduce them, but first, I'm going to make my way to the chair. Is that Lee? No? Good morning, Mr. Diep. You can hear. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, Dominic. I can hear you very clearly. Terrific. Perhaps you can't see me, but no matter. Well, no. Unfortunately, I can't. But no worries at all. We're delighted to have you here. So Mamadou Diop is not obviously with us. He is in Dakar and is joining us from our new IDRC offices in Dakar. Mamadou Diop is an associate researcher 
at a think tank that is called Innovation, Environment and Development in Africa that is located in Dakar in Senegal. And it's his research, at least that's supported by the IDRC, deals with the PREES Consortium, Pathways to Resilience in Semi-Arid Economies, as part of the research activities that focus on migration, the channeling of funds, private sector action uh, for in, to promote resilience, governance of uh, semi-arid lands uh, that have an impact on the climate uh, resilience and economic development. So welcome to you, uh, Mamadou. To my direct, uh, on my direct, uh, on my right, on your left, I have Amanda Yamanda Banks. Corporate Affairs at FinDev Canada. Yolanda has worked with both Canadian International Development Agency, now Global Affairs, and the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade with foreign postings in London, Dhaka, Addis Ababa, and um, uh, she has worked in a voluntary capacity as well, including um, uh, with uh, the Trade Facilitation Office. Um, welcome, Yolanda, and thank you all for being here today. No, ça c'est pas tout à fait correct. Avant. No, that's what happens when people sit down uh, like that. Uh, Trade Facilitation Office, um, also known as TFO, and I'm wondering if one of my IDRC colleagues could pull the podium back so that the colleagues can uh, see us on this side of the room. Thank you very much. Um, so TFO, uh, TFO Canada's roster of trade specialists and project uh, management team. He oversees planning, implementation, and communication um, with donors and partners. He works to develop strategic partnerships and initiatives with Canadian and international non-governmental organizations, think tanks and business associations, public and private sector supporters and other international and multilateral organizations in Asia and the Middle East. Welcome, Saki. Céline. Céline Back is a leader mondial. Um Celine Beck is a global leader when it comes to uh, climate change impact on business. Celine is the founding president of Analytica Advisors, difficult to say in French, and it is a consultancy firm that uh, deals with the development of global capital markets for leaders of sustainable development, uh, both with uh, long-term investors and uh, the business sector. She is also a women's ambassador, a staunch advocate as part of the Global Initiative Equal by 30, and is the senior associate at the International Institute of Sustainable Development. Céline was awarded the Médaille de Chevalier de l'Ordre National du Mérite de la France for her work mobilizing the private sector for the uh, Paris Accord in 2015. Welcome, Céline. So let's get started, shall we? I'll start in French, if I may, and we'll start with Mamadou, and then we'll switch uh, between French and English. Mamadou, yes, based on your experience of uh, working with entrepreneurs, what are the main hurdles that women face? And do you have any examples uh, that come to mind of how women have overcome these hurdles? Well, thank you very much, Dominique. If I may start by welcoming everybody in the room and also the other panelists uh, who are here today. And also to thank you warmly for this opportunity that you've given me to share the uh, outcomes of the research that we've been doing uh, under the ages of the IDRC. And as you pointed out, uh, as under this study, we face the fact uh, that uh, women, despite uh, entrepreneurship uh, into initiatives, face various hurdles, uh, which are numerous in fact, but I'd like to focus on those main hurdles. Uh, in Senegal, belief in social structures, uh, that uh, in fact preceded the status of the female entrepreneur. Uh, women are 
in fact uh, relegated uh, historically to uh, a different position in society, especially uh, from a family household standpoint. And women have to strike a white uh, work-life balance and, uh, as entrepreneurs, and, which is difficult, uh, particularly difficult. Uh, and often the, uh, in fact, uh, revenue from the company is often spent to meet the needs of the family rather than investing in the company's uh, IT capacity and uh, to promote economic development and to grow. Now, under our studies, we've uh, seen that women face obstacles to obtaining funding. Often they are deprived of property rights and also uh, equal access to uh, financing from uh, companies and lending institutions. Often the interest rates uh, are absolutely uh, unwieldy, 13% even. And this is the case in Senegal, in the business environment, which unfortunately is uh, still uh, has uh, gender inequality. We're in a, a developed uh, country, and unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of underprivileged people. And uh, unfortunately, when it comes to business infrastructure and markets, uh, IT capacity, the internet, uh, we face a level of underdevelopment. Uh, we have a lot of poor regions also in our country. And oftentimes, women don't have these opportunities open to them, which only goes to reinforce their vulnerability. Now let's now focus on support. Uh, we are in a country where female entrepreneurs rely on support from the state. This is normal, but uh, most of this support is focused in Dakar. And unfortunately, gender equality isn't often at the fore when it comes to promoting uh, women's entrepreneurship. And unfortunately, this support is politicized, it's unfortunate to say, in our country. Well, that's very interesting to hear, Mamadou. Have you had any real life experiences of how women, particular women, have overcome these hurdles, even in these semi-arid uh, areas where there's a high level of poverty. Uh, have you encountered uh, examples of where women have been able to overcome at least some of these obstacles? Uh, well, yes, indeed. When it comes to uh, the societal fabric, well, it, there are a number of advocacy uh, organisations that do empower women to overcome these obstacles that are part of the social fabric. But when it comes to access to financing, what I've seen out on the ground is that uh, when uh, they need lending support to, to meet their financial and entrepreneurial goals, women often have to turn to their families and friends and uh, Often that is a way of meeting the shortfalls when it comes to accessing financing. But they seem to manage some way or another in and uh, uh, cobble together uh, financing. But what I've seen in terms of strategies to overcome these host of challenges is, uh, in fact, the use of diversification. Women are diversifying these sectors in order to reduce vulnerability. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let me uh, take this opportunity, and uh, it, was it was remiss of me not to do so at the start of this uh, conference. Uh, we have the Ambassador for Senegal in Canada with us. It's a great honour, and uh, we're very grateful for your attendance here today. And I'm sure that for, for Mr. Dieppe, it's particularly poignant that you are here to listen to his uh, remarks. And so thank you very much. And please say a warm welcome and hello on uh, my behalf. 
Well, you can't see her, but she's right here in front of me. Well, hello, Madam Ambassador. Very pleased to make your acquaintance. Raised. I'm, I'm coming to you um, now. The, the, the challenge of balancing um, domestic responsibilities, household responsibilities, the care side of, of life as well, uh, or of the economy, in fact, and, um, and business is a challenge for women in Senegal. I suspect that you have a similar perspective from the regions in which you've been working. Um, so tell us, where are you seeing these barriers to women entrepreneurs, um, uh, and particularly in the sectors that we're interested in talking about today, in terms of climate-related efforts? Right. Um, I think before I do that, a little bit of context of who we interact with and what we do with them. Uh, so TA for Canada, Trade Facilitation Office Canada, we work to help um, you know, the small and medium enterprises from developing countries to access Canada uh, and other international markets with our information, advice, and contact services. The idea is to use trade as a tool for economic development. The, you know, so in our work uh, over the last 40 years um, in 40 plus developing countries all over the world, Latin America and Caribbean, Africa, Asia, Middle East, um, what we've um, uh, seen is that, um, you know, women face uh, challenges in many different aspects. Mm -hmm. They face challenges in their households, they face challenges in their communities, um, and of course in their business. Um, when we, you know, the interactions we've had with them, um, when we, you know, what comes out though, um, slightly different to what, what uh, Mamadou was, was explaining. Obviously, you know, the burden of care is there and those mm -hmm. are things, but when we work when, with women entrepreneurs, um, the, really the biggest, inf you know, challenge that they talk about is access to information. Mm -hmm. And this is not only information about markets. It's also information of what is available uh, as a business support service in the country for them. So, um, you know, we were, we were just, uh, you know, traveling through lots of, uh, you know, the developing countries, Asia, Middle East, uh, Africa, Latin America, and we had a lot of focus group discussions over the you know, last three weeks, and this kept coming up that when we get um, a you know, group of uh, women entrepreneurs of different sectors together, uh, one entrepreneur is getting some services through a government service uh, or through a development project that the other woman doesn't know mm -hmm. about. So just the mapping of, of those services, it's the awareness level sometimes is, is, mm -hmm. is lacking. Um, the other thing that uh, all of across the board they mentioned was the lack of differentiated services. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of incubators. There's a lot of, uh, you know, services for startups. But once a startup has taken the first few steps, there's not another differentiated service where they need different things. You know, they, they've got the skills, you know, they've found out the access to finance to, for the startup. Um, now they want to, you know, find out, you know, how to find markets, how to find out if, if they're export mm. ready or not, and those services. So these things, um, you know, this is one area that um, we've, we've found in our interactions. Um, obviously, the second largest area, um, if, if call it the second, is the access to finance. That remains in different countries where, um, you know, it's a question of, how do they access finance? Is it a collateral-based, you know, lending? Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, you know, non-collateral-based lending? Who has access over the collateral? Uh, can that collateral uh, be registered somewhere? Do they have credit history? Where is that credit history um, from your, um, you know, microfinance lender? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's surprising that women are the best microfinance lenders, but mm -hmm. as soon as they get to a financial system, that whole credit history is gone. Yes and yeah, they have to start from scratch. Um, so all of those, they, they do come, but I think interestingly for uh, you know, the women-owned uh, um, and led small and medium enterprises that mm. uh, we s interact with, access to information uh, in all those different areas is mentioned as, mm. as the, the top barrier. In terms of getting over barriers, um, you know, we've got amazing stories all over the world where 
um, the things that we feel that you know uh, women lack um, are the ones that they're actually using to mm. get over those barriers. Um, so it's their um, you know a ability to mobilize a community um, and, and to look at you know um, issues that face the whole community, the whole let's say a village, um, and then also use of technology. Mm -hmm. Those two things um, we've, we've, we've seen that, um, you know, very enterprising women, that's how they get over the barriers. Um, and there are many examples, um, you know, I'll, I'll wait for <laughs> the other sure. question to get into the examples. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks. And, it, and it, I'm liking the parallels that we're hearing from a very particular context in Senegal. They, this is not unique to Senegal, certainly, no. as I'm sure we all recognized here. I feel like I'm missing half the room here, so I shift <laughs> and I have to keep the microphone. Right. Um, very good. So thank you, Zaki. Yolanda, I saw you nodding your head. We, we, when, of course, the, the, this is a topic today is International Women's Day, but we really want to delve into the climate dimensions of this conversation and how, um, how what we are essentially facing a uh, a climate crisis. How is this manifesting in your work at the intersection of, of empowerment, women's empowerment, of um, economic empowerment and entrepreneurship, and moving in this climate resilience and climate action space? So thank you very much, Dominique. It's a great question. Uh, I work, first of all, I'll start mm -hmm. by giving some context as Zaki did. I work for FinDev Canada. So this is Canada's development finance institution. We were created in January 2018. We celebrated our second year anniversary just a few weeks ago. Uh, we are here to finance the private sector to uh, conduct business in developing countries, but not just any old business. We're an impact investor. So we want to uh, support the private sector in a way that will increase their ability to have a positive impact on uh, women's lives, on the climate, and on, on market creation or job creation. So when we set those three goals, climate, women's economic empowerment, and market development, we didn't necessarily think about the intersection of them. Mm -hmm. So I love today's topic because that's what we're being asked to do. So where does climate and women's economic empowerment tend to cross? Um, for ourselves, uh, I'll describe how it works in, uh, by way of an example. So we are financing uh, through an equity investment. We took a company in Kenya, based in Kenya, called MCOPA. Uh, M stands for mobile, and COPA is a Kiswahili word for, I believe it means uh, lending or small money. And what the company does is provide off-grid solar solutions to wow. households that live within an 80 mile radius of a capital of a city but don't have mm. a transmitted power so mm. these are and also these are generally households making less than five dollars a day so um, not well off not middle class mm -hmm. for sure and what the company does is you know cell phones have become a means of paying for things and any of you that have been to Kenya know that mobile money and PESA, this is how everybody pays for things. And so the company offers the family, the household, an opportunity to repay the cost of a solar kit through their mobile phone at cents a day. And then it's mm. paid off after a couple of years and they can add on mm. uh, household appliances. So what the company discovered, so um, I have to say, maybe it's been a journey, the company's had a journey. And mm. in the beginning it was very, they had a male sales force. The company has, at the moment, about 800 to 1,000 people who sell the, tr uh, the kits, the solar kits, at the household level. And in the beginning, they looked at the data. Data is very revealing. And they noticed that the women salespeople had sales that were off mm -hmm. the scale. And the men, perhaps, weren't doing so good. And they began to look into, but why is this? What's going on here? Began to probe, ask questions do what we call in our world, and we're in a room of Research. development specialists, it's called gender-based based analysis, mm -hmm. but it, you know, private sector company may not have seen it that way. And they discovered that at the household level, really it's the woman that's making the decisions about what the household needs, what they should spend the money on. And so when a woman was talking to a female um, salesperson, 
the dialogue was far more fluid and um, far more convincing. And so the two women would discuss what the household needs were and how the solar kit could uh, mm. enhance their lives through lighting, through replacing a fuel source that's hard to get. You have to go fetch, fetch wood or uh, polluting when you burn fuel inside the home. Mm -hmm. So certainly um, uh, the women um, were better salespeople and what the company has done is now switched over gradually their sales force which is now 80% women. Right. So these are some of the things that we see companies mm. doing but um, not everyone has such an evident solution. So other companies we might be supporting are putting in large infrastructure in the renewable space so we support mm -hmm a company called Climate Investor One. They're going to build out about uh, a, a gigawatt of renewable mm. power around the world in the next uh, 15 mm. years. So in their area, we've, what we've asked them to undertake is a gender-based analysis. How mm. can you improve conditions for women in how you conduct your business? Mm. So this is how, as a development finance institution, we see the intersection between uh, women's economic empowerment and climate. Oh, great. I, and I was nodding at Zaki's comments because nice. of something I hope we'll find an occasion to raise later. Yeah, no, we'll, we'll come back to this. And we're hearing, so certainly we're hearing about different kinds of obstacles and opportunities. So from, from obstacles um, to uh, access to um, information, access to finance, access to all kinds of resources for very poor women in rural Senegal who are isolated um, and and lacking all kinds of resources. But also we're talking about things like power, um, electricity, and how access to electricity can be transformative, and we know this, but in particular for women in terms of their role in the household and the opportunities that it provides for them. Céline, on va passer à Molière. Céline, your experience is very uh, broad and far-reaching in the energy, uh, clean energy sector. And we're looking to make uh, a link with resilience. What are the mechanisms by which women's economic empowerment can uh, promote uh, adaptation and climate resilience to reduce greenhouse gas uh, emissions, but also tools uh, to build resilience to face uh, the repercussions or ramifications of climate change? Well, that's a terrific question. And to begin with, I'd like to point out that under the IRENA mission, there is core research being undertaken on access, uh, women accessing uh, energy sources. And this is very compelling. For example, the fact that 75% of women find that there are barriers to accessing energy, but only 40% of men face the same issue. So women see a problem, but don't, men don't uh, when it comes to the same issue. I should also point out that it is crucial that this work be done properly and that we must be fully cognizant of what is transpiring when it comes to climate science. And there must be a huge investment in clean and renewable energy. We really need to be fully cognizant of what is occurring under the Paris Accord. Well, there's now the ratification of the national contribution rates which uh, for developing countries, which uh, in large part uh, rely on uh, funding. And the next three years are crucial. Why are they crucial? Because uh, global uh, emissions levels uh, are leading to three to four degrees uh, of uh, warming. And what will that mean? That will mean there'll be twice as many days where it's 50 degrees Celsius, uh, whereas it used to be 30 days a year, it's going to be 50 or 60 uh, days a year where the temperature will hit 50 degrees Celsius. This is absolutely fundamental that we think about uh, renewable clean energy sources and uh, 
in fact, uh, removing barriers to women accessing those energy sources. And there's about 120 per cent energy capacity being drawn from uh, fossil fuels. which is tied intimately with this 1.5 degree increase uh, of global warming. So each dollar that we invest in uh, dirty fuel is money that uh, will in fact mean that we're shooting ourselves in the foot uh, at the end of the day. So with that backdrop, to facilitate uh, women's access to renewable energy, there needs to be proper uh, financing. The Women and Finance Project, uh, I think we're up to uh, 70 billion of the $100 billion required to, for this uh, initiative. Uh, there is always a gender uh, gender-based analysis undertaken and a, a lens of gender equality. For example, in the Green Climate Fund, at least half of the directors of the board of directors of the Green Climate Fund are female. So there is a gender balance that is struck. As a result, there is a, a fair governance structure in place. And when women talk about what their top priorities are, capacity, training, access to energy, and access to financing, these are top priorities in the eyes of women. Why a priority to access energy? It's difficult to uh, cr 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 uh, open up new companies and new startups uh, without that. Uh, well, thank you, Celine we can see how climate action will help to uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions in uh, developing countries. And this will empower women and uh, promote women's resilience to, in the face of the barriers that they face. Because unfortunately, there is already an overwhelming amount of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the, uh, our atmosphere that have built up over time. And unfortunately, women don't have access to the same resources and therefore their capacity for adaptation is less. So we're here to discuss how the private sector can help empower women and, by virtue of that, promote resilience. And also to lead us to a low carbon economy, even in countries in the global south, but also worldwide. Now, Mamadou, I'd like to turn to you that, with a question that I'd like to ask to every member of the panel. Just in a couple of minutes, please. What do you see the role of the private sector as being? And what is your experience of uh, particular private sector companies uh, in, uh, in fact, uh, removing barriers to women's economic empowerment and promoting climate resilience? Well, thank you very much, Dominique, for your question. Unfortunately, the Senegalese, Senegalese uh, private sector isn't like that in other countries. It has to be developed slowly and carefully. And we need to factor that in, in most uh, developing countries, that issue. If you look at what's happening in Senegal, the, most of the corporations are foreign multinational corporations that have a foothold in Senegal. And uh, Moreover, 90% of the industrial 
uh, force of Senegal comes from that. We do have uh, labour and management organisations in Senegal that you may or may not be aware of. But another way to in engage and mobilise the private sector in this direction is, uh, well, it's crucial, but the private sector is, uh, of course, focuses on profits. And so we need to maximise the uh, cap flow of capital. And it's also important to have the right rhetoric. We need to encourage the private sector to concern itself with climate change. We need to convince the private sector that they are part and parcel of the solution. But as, unfortunately, the wrong approach is being taken. If you invite the private sector to meetings on climate change, they'll believe that they're being there to be castigated because they're the big polluters and that they're, we're there to criticise them. So we need to adopt a different approach. We need, of course, climate change is a threat, but we need to convince the private sector that climate change provides for a whole host of positive economic spin-offs and opportunities. Moreover, we realised that the private sector is not fully cognisant of the risk that companies face when it comes to climate change and that the uh, private sector didn't have enough, uh, in fact, uh, scientific data that uh, ties economic opportunity with uh, climate change adaptation. And to, to our great satisfaction, one of the two major uh, labour unions in Senegal said that it is thanks to the findings of our research that they have started to factor in climate change in their discussions and decision making process and that's the first step because the private sector is now discussing climate change and that is already a step in the right direction because it now the other thing that we've observed is that when it comes to renewable energy and reducing pollution, well, the private sector is also getting on board with that, but this is uh, very s slowly. Look, if you look at uh, some of the small uh, businesses inland in Senegal, they just don't have access to all of this uh, uh, information. And currently, and as a, a female business owner and leader said quite wisely, we need to uh, be careful as we uh, convince the private sector and use the right kind of rhetoric and tread carefully. So thanks to the implementation of uh, the panel on climate change, the private sector is becoming a stakeholder on that uh, committee and also the private sector is starting to see how they can actually benefit from climate change adaptation and renewable energy. Well, thank you very much, Mamadou. It is tough for small and medium-sized businesses in Senegal obviously, but there is a need for further development uh, in the global south uh, so that uh, these small businesses can flourish and also so that women uh, uh, can be economically empowered. And this is difficult when it, there's a context of, or backdrop of poverty. And sometimes climate change adaptation can seem uh, too overwhelming uh, to deal with that and fighting poverty and other underdevelopment issues at the same time. But perhaps there is a way not only of getting women and businesses more in bo on board with climate change resilience and renewable energies uh, in a more subtle way. Now, do you see a link with the FinDev's uh, my mandate, which is to target companies that focus on economic development, but also its social uh, impacts. And what, how do you perceive the uh, private sector's uh, action? 
Well, first, the private sector has to open its eyes uh, to the opportunities uh, for women heading up their companies uh, and all the benefits uh, that can flow from that. Uh, and you just have to look at how many members of senior management are women in most companies. Often it's zero. On your board of directors, are there any women, for example? Among your employees, are there any women? How, as a company director, can you make sure that women provide benefits across the board for these companies if they're placed in these positions? Can they be provided with a technical training, for example, especially in the renewable energy sector? What we've observed in that sector is that there is gender inequality across the board and it is uh, highly unfortunate. But th they come back, uh, the companies, and simply say that the women aren't suitably qualified, they don't have the technical uh, expertise. Entrepreneurs and business people also need to think about uh, their companies in terms of the services they provide. Uh, how can we promote access to the products and services that these companies provide to women? Uh, and that's another angle to, that uh, entrepreneurs can take uh, to looking at this issue. And I, uh, FinDev is working hand in hand uh, with our clients uh, to help them to uh, take on a new way of seeing things. And at the end of the day, what entrepreneurs are seeing as it to, is to, in, by, to increase turnover uh, and sales figures that they should in fact engage women and that they can have a better bottom line. The private sector can act to deliver these multiple benefits of climate resilience uh, climate action that reduces climate uh, change as well as women's economic empowerment. What have you seen uh, as an example of this uh, working well? Well, um, you know, f for us in the space we work in, um, you know, trade, um, and uh, we, we see a little bit difference between the space on commodities and non-commodities. If you can imagine um, a coffee buyer, you know, is much more open to hearing about sustainable sourcing, climate smart agriculture, because they clearly see there's not enough coffee in the world uh, to meet demand. So, you know, they have to be, uh, you know, so they, they know. But if you take an apparel, uh, you know, or a footwear, there seems to be enough apparel and footwear to wrap the planet five times over and still have more. So um, uh, we see clearly a difference, uh, yeah, you know, in the, in the commodity versus non-commodity sector in terms of, of, of being open to, um, you know, the discussions on business versus, you know, business profits versus sustainable sources, um, you know, climate smart agriculture or climate smart practices. Mm -hmm. um, and we feel that, you know, that private sector mm -hmm. has to play the, mm -hmm. it is the key role player mm -hmm. in, in this whole, whole space. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, yeah, that, that's been our experience so far. Um, through our work, um, you know, obviously we are um, bringing in, uh, you know, we're seeing that there is enough, um, you know, not the biggest buyers, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, in certain provinces, certain areas in Canada, in the United States, Europe, mm -hmm. there are um, smaller buyers who are environmentally conscious, they're interested in where their, mm -hmm. you know, um, goods and, um, you know, products are being sourced from. Um, and they're even willing to go to the developing countries and help uh, with, you mm -hmm. know, from the suppliers. So I, I, I think that's a positive note. We want to understand more about that mm -hmm. and continue while working mm -hmm. in that space. Now, understanding at this stage that's still a very small in terms of dollar volume, mm -hmm. that's still a small space, so it's not a high volume, uh, you know, place. But you know that that's uh, that's our um, work to mm -hmm. be, you know, developing that space. 
So then how is this, how is your, from your experience, have you seen the private sector really moving in this direction that's, that's an, a change agent bringing, bringing women's entrepreneurship forward as well as the climate action? Um, well, I'd, I'd say that the research that was undertaken by IRENA um, mm -hmm. on gender and um, energy, both from the perspective of representation in large companies, mm -hmm. as, as Mamadou spoke about mm -hmm. earlier, so you know, equal by 30, equal representation at all levels, board level, senior management level, STEM, non-STEM, mm -hmm. you know, the whole gamut of the companies. Um, that research is, is I think, uh, really worth hanging mm -hmm. your hat on, very, mm -hmm. very strong. There's also um, a, a very interesting uh, global organization called Women in Renewable Energy, uh, which is growing and mm. uh, is now, I think it's, it's uh, launched in Turkey, it's now in Jordan, it's in many emerging um, economies. Um, and just to do a little bit of publicity, next mm. week there will be an event at the French Embassy uh, entitled Our, Will Women Save the Planet? And uh, the world leader of women in renewable energy will be there. I'll be interviewing her. Mm -hmm. So I really look forward to speaking with Joanna Osawe, mm -hmm. who's a very interesting mm -hmm. leader in energy. Um, I, you know, I, I think that uh, if we just let our imagination take us mm -hmm. uh, to different places, we'll see what energy can do for women mm -hmm. from an economic empowerment perspective, whether it's, it's within the household, cooking mm -hmm. and lighting for girls to do homework, or outside of the household just refrigeration to build up new mm. commodity businesses, uh, refrigeration for health. Mm. You know, obviously we need refrigeration for vaccines, for all kinds of things. Um, and then refrigeration for other, you know, industrial sort of processes, uh, cold chain and things like mm. that. Uh, so I see that at renewable energy, um, which is the cheapest form of energy, mm. you know, let's think, let's just put that out there. Um, if it's not the cheapest form of energy, it's because the financing is too expensive. And mm -hmm. if it, the financing is too expensive, it's because we need to backstop national development banks so that they can provide, they can, they can access mm -hmm. liquid capital markets and get globally competitive mm -hmm. um, bond issues uh, that will enable us to um, make renewable energy the, the absolute cheapest uh, source of energy. The only other thing I would say is that um, it is worth, I think, um, being aware of the Marrakesh Partnership for um, High Ambition, mm -hmm. uh, which emanated from the Paris Agreement. It was originally called the Lima Paris Platform. It is a platform for voluntary contributions. I hear people, mm -hmm. see people nodding. It's now sometimes referred to as We Mean Business. Uh, we mean business companies are making commitments to decarbonization by 2050, uh, 1.5 degree uh, sort of pace of decarbonization. Um, so that means 50% reductions by 2030. They have global supply chains. Those supply chains extend to all kinds of interesting mm -hmm. commodities. They will be looking for zero carbon um, inputs. That means renewable energy you know, um, powered uh, supply chains. Um, mm -hmm. And they will, um, I'm sure as of um, September at the UN General Assembly, there'll be a major, um, uh, I think, coming together about gender and mm -hmm. climate. And my expectation is that those voluntary commitments are mm -hmm. going to start to have a gender lens as well. So I'm, I'm optimistic. So that's, it's really exciting. And, and I think, well, I have one more question that will speak to the panel and then we'll be coming to all of you to uh, jump into this conversation about the the triple benefit of of climate action, improving resilience to the impacts of climate and economic empowerment, or I would even say economic empowerment of women as a means to mm. improving resilience and uh, and climate action. We're a, a funder of research at IDRC. That's what we do. We fund research in developing regions by developing country. Um, researchers and research organizations to try and answer um, questions that are important to overcome obstacles, uh, find solutions that will help advance the goals, the development goals that, that we've been talking about. Um, my question, I think, je vais passer à Mamadou une dernière fois avant de passer au public ici. 
I'll direct my question at uh, Mamadou first before we turn to everyone else in the room. Mamadou, in your opinion, what are the most important and urgent uh, research issues and in order to fast-track women's economic empowerment, especially vis-à-vis -vis climate action. Well, thank you very much, Dominic. Before responding quickly to that question, may I just come back to the women's economic empowerment in Senegal? Earlier I spoke about labour management organisations. There is a labour organisation that... Uh, it's an umbrella organisation to help uh, female entrepreneurs uh, s uh, have their startups actually see the light of day. And in my various uh, meetings with the president and chair of that organisation, we discussed uh, the, these startups uh, that women can create. And they said that labour management organisations didn't take enough into account. Uh, women's concerns and that they need to set up their own structures as female entrepreneurs to bring their concerns to the fore and have them adequately addressed. Now, having said that, when it comes to the research that we have undertaken, we've been able to highlight a number of emerging and key issues, the first of which has to do with the real impact of social norms in Senegal. Obviously, there is this dual level of vulnerability for female entrepreneurs in Senegal. We've already discussed this, but we need scientific research that can measure the real ramifications of these social norms on the vulnerability of uh, women and how that undermines their ability uh, to be enterprising. Now, let's discuss the opportunities that climate change and global warming provides. I think that needs to be more in-depth research uh, such that enterprising women are more fully aware of the opportunities that are available through climate change and global warming. People speak oftentimes about such opportunities, but oftentimes uh, female entrepreneurs underscore their how hard it is to get access to that information. Unfortunately, uh, the dissemination of information is not that great in Senegal, and especially in, in rural areas in Senegal, there's a very low rate of female entrepreneurship. And so that is how research data would be able to help uh, female entrepreneurs uh, to identify what the opportunities that stem from climate change and global warming actually are, economically and speaking and otherwise. Now, earlier I spoke of uh, a mechanism's for the transference of technology, especially under the Paris Climate Accord and also the United Nations uh, Framework on Climate Change. Increasingly, we talk uh, under those uh, initiatives of uh, technology transference. Now, what are the tra technologies that we need to hone in on? This needs to be documented and we need to determine how female opportunities can use these tools, this technology, to flourish and to be empowered, especially with a view to being more resilient. And the other issue is the global environment. Well, there's been great efforts to improve the environment across the board in Senegal, but we need to see Well, I, I think we shouldn't be talking about the business environment uh, just uh, writ large. We need to focus in on the subtleties of it, and I think that the business environment needs to factor in gender issues, gender equality, gender inequality. I think that research needs to step in and help out in that respect. Well, thank you very much, Mamadou. Many uh, key entry points from his perspective um, an experience in Senegal in terms of this question of women's economic empowerment and the, the what where research could help accelerate um, the climate benefits of women's economic empowerment, both for them and for everyone. 
Um, Yolanda, I'll come to you and say, in addition to what Mamadou has already offered, are you seeing any key research gaps that can help inform our thinking going forward? Um, if I had to, I don't have a specific area mm -hmm. where I think IDRC could invest, but uh, a general area. Mm -hmm. So what we see is um, tech incubators mm -hmm. and even um, where you would least expect them, perhaps, in uh, countries that uh, don't, aren't technologically strong. Mm -hmm have uh, women, including women, men and women, mm -hmm. who are very oriented towards new technologies mm -hmm. and are developing applications for technologies to solve problems in mm -hmm. their world mm -hmm. and in their environment. So um, recently we've become aware of an, or, uh, an association in Africa called Women in Tech Africa. Mm -hmm. And there are others. And so there are lots of tech incubators around. Are there things we could do with them to help bring the technologies that they're developing, perhaps on a workbench in a lab, mm -hmm. to a commercial application? Mm -hmm. And these are technologies that are looking at climate resilience, um, mm -hmm. applications in the agricultural sector, and... Uh, I would say general business as well. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of opportunities there. They're starved of, of cash, of money, of financing. And um, they're in so early stage that it's not really for a financier to become mm -hmm. involved, but is perhaps an ideal place for an organization like IDRC. So mm -hmm. that's that's something that very much springs to mind for me. Great. Well, and I'm, I'm sure that there may be others who want to come in, but I want to get to the audience. I'll just segue over to you by saying that these issues of scaling the um, scaling innovations or providing opportunities in a context in which innovation can uh, flourish and scale is a key uh, challenge, I think, for the entire research funding sector as we think about how we scale the impact of the research investments we make. Um, it's also clear to me that for women entrepreneurs across the spectrum, I would say from, from very um, isolated or, or uh, poor uh, women in the agricultural sector, there are opportunities even for them to um, take actions that will contribute to their own improved resilience, but also ultimately, if they're supported with access to resources, information, um, and support, they can take action in the agricultural sector to help reduce the impact of that sector on climate change, which is important. But in order to do that, they may need to be connected to innovators, women and men innovators, in, uh, in a whole sort of ecosystem that may be providing some solutions to help those rural women um, become more empowered and take those actions. And I'm using agriculture only as one example. It's certainly um, action in the food set systems, wherever they are, at, at, we're talking very um, extensive types of systems in rural Senegal or more highly processed, highly transformed global food systems, these food systems are contributing 20% of, of greenhouse gas emissions of carbon at the moment. This is a tremendous opportunity for action in this sector that will have this resilience benefit economic empowerment because it's a sector that's a huge employment sector for women and, and business sector for women and that ultimately action that we need to take to get step back from that four degrees of, of global warming that we are heading towards if we don't accelerate this kind of action. Um, so many good suggestions for uh, us as we think about our new strategy going forward and where to orient our research funding so that it helps um, in a really focused way make the biggest difference to, to achieve these goals. Um, why don't I pass it over to the audience? I'm sure that this has sparked many ideas and thoughts from any of you. I see lots of familiar faces. Please don't be shy. Make your way to the microphone if you'd like to engage in uh, this conversation with us. There's two microphones here. Dans la langue de votre choix. In the language of your choosing. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, analysts for uh, an outstanding uh, presentation. Yeah. 
I would say the only challenge right now is to limit my questions to just <laughs> one, because <laughs> there are so many great ideas. And could you introduce yourself too, Absolutely. Please? My name is Carol Terrier, and I'm a doctoral stu student at um, Carleton University, and I'm studying in anthropology and the resilience of communities mm -hmm. after uh, massive disasters. And one of the things that I, I really piqued when you asked about the research gaps is there's a very strong connection between the resilience of women, women entrepreneurs, in the disaster industry. Mm. And if we're talking about climate change, an, outli an, outli that, uh, or an outlay that, um, that Celine pointed out of three years, mm. right? Whether it's a time of critical change and as we're facing, and a lot of these, a lot of the countries in the global south are facing massive potential changes due to climate change. One of the big things is the frequency of storms, the frequency of sudden onset disasters. Mm. Is there room, according to the panelists, Mamadou as well, um, the panelists uh, in identifying potential opportunities in the disaster industry for micro businesses run by women? Mm. And is that a potential for and I use the word very lightly here, empowerment, because mm. it's an overused word. Mm. But is there an opportunity there? Is it present? And is there a possibility mm. for expanding that support to those women? Great. Thank you for the question. Maybe I'll take a couple more questions, because I'm mindful of time. So maybe if we can have some, a few more questions, I'll come back to the panel for, uh, for their views. Please, go ahead. Thank you. First off, very interesting uh, uh, session. There were a couple of things that were mentioned that reminded me of over the last three years. My name is Derek Ireland. I'm an international consultant, local, local consultant here in Ottawa. I've been doing work in Nepal, and I've been struck by four or five things there that I thought might be relevant to uh, future yeah. research in your area. One, of course, is Nepal is one of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change. Mm -hmm. The second thing was that many rural and urban households are now being led by women. Mm. That means women are increasingly, in fact, the women are the, the leaders in terms of the small businesses that are that are everywhere, of course, in South Asia and, and in the global south. But also, they're heading up households now that are agricultural households. Mm. Two things that the research was suggesting: one is that uh, women, of course, are, don't have the experience; they don't sometimes have much less education, especially mm. in rural areas and so on. But a more positive aspect of the research that was being reported on is that women are developing self-confidence, empowerment, yeah. and, mm. and all those kinds of words by having to head, head up the household. They're, they're also, as you noted, I think somebody noted, that they work more cooperatively and collectively than males do, mm. and they seem to be doing that in the rural areas that are affected. So my question is, is anybody aware of how and the final thing, of course, is the abundance research that you've been noting. Women are much more receptive to and much more adaptable to messages both good and bad about climate change. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's, I'm picking that up on research I'm doing right now on a totally different issue for a consumers group in Canada. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, to what extent are people looking at agricultural households where mm -hmm. the male is now absent because of male migration? Mm -hmm. uh, and in the case of uh, Nepal, it's mass migration. It's about 40% often in the areas I was working mm -hmm. in are now headed up by women what that might mean for climate change in the rural area, what that means for women playing a larger role in their communities from that mm -hmm. point of view, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Benny, any others? Yes, there's one more. So let's take one more, and then, uh, and then I'll come back to the panel. And then if we have time, we'll come back to you. We have a, a, cl a short closing uh, remarks as well. Hello. Uh, I have questions for each of uh, uh, each speaker. My name is Nilo Stelik. I'm a trade expert with the Turkish Embassy. So my first question is uh, for you, Ms. Yolanda. Does FINDEV Canada uh, support uh, women entrepreneurs? Do you have a specific, specific focus on women entrepreneurs? Uh, or, and uh, do you only support Canadian entrepreneurs or also uh, entrepreneurs in developing countries? Another question for Ms. Zaki, Mr. Zaki. Uh, you said that you held many, uh, a few projects with uh, women entrepreneurs, such as focus groups. So what was the outcome uh, of these projects, uh, the concrete outcome? 
And uh, Ms. Selin, uh, you said that uh, there is an initiative called uh, Women and Renewable Energy launched in Turkey. So I would like to more, uh, know more about this initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, for Mr. Mamudu, uh, vous avez dit que uh, dans les traités he said that in international treaties, and including and also the Paris Accord and the UN Convention on Climate Change, that there are clauses on technology transference. And to date, what has been the effect of that in Senegal, i.e. as far as uh, technology transference is concerned? Specific and more general uh, questions, the link to um, the um, uh, the whole response to disaster and uh, resilience after disasters, and where the opportunities for women's economic empowerment might be, the case of. Um, uh, the very, um, and, and not only in South Asia, but strong case in Nepal of out-migration of men, and certainly that's a revenue diversification strategy because of the remittances, but then it creates new challenges for women and opportunities as, as household heads, um, particularly in agriculture, and I suspect that we have similar dynamics in Senegal as in Nepal around uh, women having a much stronger suddenly sometimes a uh, role and what that might mean. And then you each had some specific questions from the last um, uh, questioner. So why don't I turn it to, to Yolanda first? So I'll start by ask, answering a question that was directed to me specifically. I don't see her anymore. Oh, there you are. Um, so are we looking specifically for women entrepreneurs? Uh, no, what we're looking for are businesses that will have a very good impact on women entrepreneurs. I shouldn't say no, but not necessarily. So uh, it could be the businesses led by women, but what we're looking for is a business that will have business operations that will have a very favorable impact on women, either in how they hire, how they have um, senior their senior management cadre, or the services that they provide. And if the business doesn't have a strong enough profile in terms of its positive impact for women, we ask the company to make a commitment there too. Mm -hmm. um, one of the transactions of which I'm personally most proud is our, um, it's an equity investment in an investment fund run by two women. Uh, we actually have two investment funds, both run by women. Uh, that's, that's a black swan. That's extremely mm -hmm. unusual because in mm -hmm. equity investment, women are, it's a bit like, no offense to engineers, but it's a bit like engineering, you know, women aren't well represented. So uh, private equity, likewise, you don't find a lot of uh, investment funds run by women. But we invested in one, in, uh, it's jointly based in South Africa and in Lagos. And these women worked for large investment houses and they decided to leave and start their own investment yeah. funds. So, and they're going to invest in women-led SMEs in Sub-Saharan Africa. So very uh, unique and very novel. So that's our approach to supporting uh, women in business. Not necessarily, but great if we find it. Otherwise, we ask the company to make a commitment. Um, uh, about Canadian entrepreneurs, we don't have a commitment to supporting Canadian entrepreneurs. In fact, of our portfolio of about 12 deals, we only have one Canadian company. So our objective is to support businesses that operate in the global south. They may be uh, foreign-led, they may be from companies that are nationally based. It, it, we're agnostic on that. We're mm -hmm. looking for businesses that are uh, well run and have the opportunity or likelihood of scale or growth. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, Mamadou, je passe la parole à vous pour... Mamadou, the floor is yours if you'd like to respond to the questions that were asked. Were you able to follow? Mamadou, there was a question about uh, identifying opportunities in the disaster industry for micro-businesses involving women. We also had a question regarding opportunities, uh, that is, economic opportunities for uh, women, as I said, uh, in the wake of disasters. There was another question about uh, women as the heads of the households. 
not just uh, challenges but opportunities. As you spoke uh, to, uh, to regarding the uh, your particular context back home, and then there was uh, finally the issue of uh, technology transference. Uh, yes, the floor is yours, uh, Madhu. Well, first, like me, uh, thank the folks that took the floor and uh, were kind enough to ask such poignant questions. First, let me respond to the question regarding uh, the uh, transference of uh, technology. Well, she'll surely be disappointed by my answer. When I got interested in that particular mechanism, it was particularly in relation to female entrepreneurs. I'd observed out in the field that uh, women needed uh, uh, technology, oftentimes uh, that wouldn't even be that costly, so they could be more resilient. Uh, for example, women who need uh, clothing racks uh, and sometimes in the rainy season when there's not enough sun, well, there weren't enough uh, of those technologies available to them. Now, when I got interested in the transference of technology mechanisms, what I observed in Senegal is that uh, there is a national authority for IT transference, and that is the uh, Research Centre for Renewable Energies. And when I concretely asked what that centre does when it comes to technology transference, they said to me that it was limited to changes to the structure of the state, in the, of the state, the government. Uh, for example, the uh, office that looks after upgrading uh, uh, companies in Senegal. So when it comes to strengthening capacity, especially in relation to enterprising women, we'll have to see how we can cooperate with these economic entities to derive uh, spin-offs uh, economically. Now, have there been any companies that have benefited directly from uh, technology transference? Well, in fact, there are two structures that have been targeted specifically to derive support in this area. Now, let's turn to the issue of Nepal and the second question that was asked. I was there at a conference on climate change and gender issues, and I realised that uh, in Senegal our situation was very similar. Now, just turning back to our research. We observe that uh, in Senegal there are regions that are very affected by migration and male migration leads to more freedom for women. Oftentimes women derive a benefit from these funding in the areas of health care and uh, education. So oftentimes women have been able to have more uh, weight in the decision-making processes due to the remittances that uh, were then given to them. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mamadou. It's very interesting what you've observed. Uh, it, it can be a huge challenge, but also an opportunity for women. And the changing the fundamental relationship uh, between women and men that is uh, the result of the fact that men do leave home and work uh, elsewhere and the remittances uh, that uh, come as a result. Before we close... For one minute each to come in uh, before I, I hand it to Ian. Um, uh, maybe I should respond to uh, sure. the question. Yeah. Um, the, um, so the, the focus group discussions that I mentioned, um, those were part of uh, a scoping mission that we did for mm -hmm. our new project uh, that we are working with, uh, with Global Affairs Canada. It's called Women in Trade for Inclusive and Sustainable Growth. 
Um, so the objective of those focus group discussions was to get the feedback from different stakeholders and um, put in a project implementation plan, mm -hmm. which, which we did. So the objective, and, and uh, you know, once it's officially launched, you will get to know what that project is. But it's also something with um, you know, IDRC, uh, the research element of that is something we're working with IDRC, is going to be called the Women in Trade Knowledge Platform. Mm, okay. So um, yeah, you, well, I'm sure um, anybody who's interested will be able to find out that, about more about that from our website. Excellent. Um, just very briefly, I'd be happy to uh, follow up in terms of details of, about women in renewable energy um, and also the, the research by IRENA. Uh, just in terms of, of disaster um, entrepreneurship, we'll call it for that for the moment, um, it, it seems to me that there is something that we could look at in terms of nature-based solutions and women who are entrepreneurs uh, and stewards of nature-based solutions um, in some parts of the world, it's corals, it's mangroves, it's, it, it you know, depends. Um, it's not something we've talked about today, but I thought I should highlight it. And, and I would also like to highlight the important role um, in some of the sort of institutional work uh, being done of public procurement um, and the opportunity for there to be uh, very clear criteria and research on public procurement from mm -hmm. women, um, because that is a, an enormous lever in terms of economic opportunity. Fantastic. Great. Well, please join me. Uh, we'll have a few closing remarks in just a moment. But before we head to the closing remarks, please join me in thanking Mamadou Diab, who's beaming in from uh, Senegal. Merci, uh, Yolanda Banks, um, Zaki, and Céline for joining us this morning and sharing their perspectives and on this important question that, as you may have guessed, is central to IDRC's concerns as we think about what needs to be done between now and 2030 and the deadline for the SDGs, in addition to everything that we need to do to accelerate action on climate change in the context of the Paris Agreement. It's a huge agenda. We are convinced that women um, are key and the empowerment of women are key to arriving at those solutions. Um, and we are ready to help support uh, with research the most important questions to help unlock that potential and move the way forward. So thank you. Please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank yeah. Now, um, just I would like to invite Ian. Where are you, Ian? I can't see. Are you here, Ian? There you are. Great. So, Ian. Um, Ian Thompson is a policy specialist at Oxfam Canada. Do you want to speak from there, Ian? I think it we'll, uh, might be easier for you if you come up here because um, for the video. Otherwise, you'll be uh, speaking from a disembodied voice. <laughs> Ian is a policy specialist at Oxfam Canada. He's specializing in gender justice in the extractive industries, mining uh, in particular, but has extensive experience working in women's economic empowerment. And in collaboration with partners and colleagues in Canada and in 30 countries, he has been advocating for public policy reform and changing industry norms to tackle the gender bias around natural resource extraction, who benefits, who bears the risk, and who holds power. Thanks, Ian. Over to you. Thank you, Dominique. Um, so thanks everyone, thanks to the panelists. Um, reflecting back some of the most interesting things I heard this morning, and after such a stimulating morning, there's lots to share, but I'll be <laughs> brief. Um, I was very pleased that uh, right off the top, Mamadou, in identifying some of the obstacles that we're facing around these issues, identified gender relations and gender norms that need to be transformed. And I think that was a theme that I heard other people lifting up as well. That it's not just about technological transformations that we're talking about, but an underlying social transformation that has to happen. I think that's exciting, but also daunting at the same time. Second thing I heard from many of the panelists was really how drawing on women's 
skills and capacities is part of this solution. These are, these are not uh, people lacking in skills and capacities. What we have are systems that are not unleashing those skills and capacities or are holding them back. Um, I heard several of the panelists illustrate that with very interesting examples that I think uh, shows a lot of promise. Uh, on a third point, I heard the importance of governance and institutions that is going to be part of this transformation. Cillian, you mentioned it around some of the multilateral institutions like the Green Climate Fund or even how regional development banks are supported and are able to direct their support. But I think applying that, that gender justice lens to our institutions, our, our rules, our governance is going to be key in really driving some of the changes that we've been talking about this morning. And, and that's actually, the fourth point was, how do we scale this up? I heard lots of interesting, innovative examples, but some of you talked about, how do you get beyond that incubator stage? You, we, we, don't, we don't have time for this to gradually seep out. <laughs> we need to accelerate this. And how are we going to accelerate? How do we scale up um, some of these um, innovations? Uh, which is, brings me to the final point I heard, which was that need for evidence. Uh, to really demonstrate when innovation is working and where we should be scaling up. Um, it, that's so key. It's a role that IDRC and, and all of the people on the panel can clearly play. But the, the evidence is really about asking questions that maybe haven't been asked before and seeking answers from people who uh, haven't been listened to before. Uh, and so part of that is kind of reframing how we do research. Um, not just uh, what those research outcomes are, but even what the research processes will be, I think are quite exciting. I, I wanted to end by just saying something that I didn't hear, and I was a bit surprised, was um, I didn't hear as much urgency as I expected. Um, I, when I think about climate and gender justice, I feel like we really have to get moving. And um, I, I think it was a subtext of the way many of you were discussing it, but um, I would encourage all of us to be a bit more bold, to talk about transformation. Um, we don't want to be tinkering around the edges anymore. Um, so using language that is a bit more bold is something that uh, I would encourage all of us to do. Um, and certainly, the, the feminists and women's rights activists who are part of transforming these structures and these social norms uh, are showing us you know, how to speak boldly to power. Um, I hope that as we all um, walk together into International Women's Day, um, we can keep those struggles in mind, find ways of supporting them. I think that's what I would close with, is that the panel has clearly demonstrated that everyone, no matter where we sit, in whatever institution you might be connected to, whatever your role in society is, there's a part to play. And so you leave me with a lot of hope uh, for the future and where we can go with this. Thank you. Very well done. Um, that's not easy to summarize all of that. So thank you, Ian, for taking the time to wrap it for us. It means that I don't have to do it. Madame l'Ambassadrice Excellence, merci d'être parmi Your Excellency Ambassador, thank you for being here. Sharing your morning with us. Um, and thanks again to the panelists. Go forth in this snowy weather. Mamadou, merci d'avoir été là depuis le Sénégal. Nous apprécions énormément. Mamadou, thanks for joining us from Senegal. We really appreciate the effort you went to to be here with us today. Have a good afternoon.